Hi, and welcome to the story of cooking. I'm Sarah Nicholas. This show explores people and their unique story of cooking. It will be a historical journey as well as a culinary experience. Each week we're going to look at a different group of people and their unique story of cooking. You don't have to be a four-star chef, but you can have a love for cooking and an interest in history and create these meals in your own home. This week we're going to look at samurai meals. I never um, really knew that much about samurai and I actually got into the history of samurai because I married a man who was obsessed with samurai movies and I just thought well Japanese culture is so interesting and I'm sure there's a lot of information you can learn about the samurai and I was right. Uh, hopefully we can do it justice in 30 minutes but there's so much that you can learn about the samurai traditions and what they've done for food in Japan, the culture of Japan. Um, and some of their, their sake traditions and their tea ceremonies alone you could probably spend a week talking about. The first dish we're going to make is a Chinese yam soup that would have been really popular in the samurai culture. Uh, we do not unfortunately have a Chinese yam uh, to use but we're going to substitute it with a potato. A Chinese yam actually looks a lot like a potato except it's a little longer and it's got spikes on it but the inside of it is white just like a potato is and it's really really starchy probably the best substitute if you do not um, have a Chinese yam would be a taro um, which is also a tuberous root vegetable just something really starchy because actually when you um, get into the inside of the Chinese yam it's actually slimy and starchy so you want something that is as close to that as possible a potato will work it will not be perfect but it will work um, for our dish today and it's really easy to find a potato anywhere. You probably have to go to a specialty market to find um, a Chinese yam. Uh, literally translated, Toraro is long potato in Chinese. Okay, so the first thing we're gonna do is get our broth going. This is a soup. We have dashi broth, and all dashi is is well actually dashi dashi is really popular in Japanese culture it's actually like we use chicken stock dashi is a Japanese cooking broth and it's a base of a lot of Japanese dishes and it's the base of this dish today as well dashi is actually made out of kelp that has been brought almost to a boil with water and then strained and that's your dashi broth and we'll actually work with that kelp in the next dish uh, that kelp is called kombu Okay, so we added one third cup of dashi. And to that we're going to add soy sauce and some mirin. We're gonna let that heat. There's a lot of interesting history about samurai. Um, in Japan, they were the warrior class. Uh, one thing that people always think of is them being like this tiny elite group of people. In fact, they were actually a whole social class and they took up about 10% of the Japanese population. So that's not a small group of people. The cuisine they would have eaten would have been very simple. The samurai could range from very poor to very rich. So what they ate also depended on their, their wealth level. So you could have a very poor samurai or a very rich samurai, um, but as part of a daily meal, it would have been these basic kinds of dishes. Another myth about samurai is there are actually female samurai as well. Uh, a lot of the table manners the Japanese have today were developed by the samurai in the 16th and 17th century. The idea of chopsticks actually came out of the samurai as well. They weren't only well known for their table manners, of course they were also well known for their skills in battle. And they also had an incredible fashion sense. They had very elaborate costumes for battle as well. Okay, so the next thing we're going to do is we're going to take our potato, which again is our substitute for our Chinese yam. If you have an Asian market, you probably can find Chinese yam. So that would be my first choice, but this will do for today. Okay. So once that's kind of heated, I'm going to remove it from the, the burner. We're going to take our yam and we're going to grate it. Okay. So traditionally, they would have taken the Chinese yam and they would have grated it into a mortar and pestle. 
and slowly added the dashi until it became a thick porridge. Because that's what, that's, that's what it's going to look like at the end. This yam soup will look like a porridge. So the word samurai, um, they first came about in the 8th century and literally translated it means those who serve. Or some people say it literally translated it means to guard, but ones that serve. Okay, so we've got our potato almost grated, almost finished grating. And what we're going to do next is we're going to add this broth into the potato mixture. That's good enough. So ideally, again, you would have a mortar and pestle once you got to this stage. You would dump this mixture into the mortar and pestle bowl and you would grind it as you slowly added your dashi broth. So this kind of, well, not this kind, but a Chinese yam would have been popular, especially during the Edo period of Japan, um, especially amongst travelers and the samurai class because it was easy and it was available. So you just keep stirring it in until you reach kind of a porridge-like consistency. Normally if you find this at a Japanese restaurant nowadays it's served over rice or noodles and sometimes this is also kind of a base of a soup um, and they put it in like an egg drop kind of soup with the yam and the dashi broth. But it's really easy to make it's kind of flavorful. I think it's, for my personal taste, it's better over something, but this is good too. And with the Chinese yam, it won't look this, it'll look whiter than it is in appearance. So if you want it to look more traditional, you can put it through a food processor or a food mill, um, or you can even just take an immersion blender to it like you would um, a bisque or something like that. But you don't want to strain it. Um, too much because you still want it to have a little body. And there you have it, your traditional samurai yam soup. I'm going to clean this area up and when we come back we're going to make our kombu rice. Welcome back, we have everything ready for our kombu rice. This is a really really simple dish to make, in fact it's only two ingredients. So you can't screw this one up, but this definitely would have been a staple for the samurai. Rice is a staple in Japanese culture and it definitely was a staple in a samurai's diet as well. A samurai would have typically gotten 900 grams of rice a day for his daily ration or her daily ration. Um, they were fed the husked rice as opposed to the gentile class which would have had the polished rice. But definitely rice and kombu would have been two things that they would have probably eaten on a daily basis. Okay, it's literally as simple as taking your kombu um, I think I mentioned earlier what kombu was. Kombu is actually kelp. It's edible kelp. It looks a lot like seaweed, but it is not seaweed. It's not the same thing. You can find it at Asian markets. Sometimes you can find it in specialty grocery stores, but certainly at an Asian market because it is a staple in um, Asian cuisine. Uh, kombu comes dried and normally in sheets. And if you can find a whole piece of kombu, it actually is probably a lot taller than I am. It will actually, you can buy it in six feet tall. But normally in an Asian grocery store it's going to come dried and a lot of times shredded. So all we've done to this kombu is rehydrate it. When we bought it, it was uh, dark in color. It was almost black and it was dried and it was, this is tripled in size. So we've rehydrated it and we've chopped it up a little bit. I'm going to chop it up a little bit more. But this is what it looks like once it's got a little life back into it. And it smells very, very fishy, obviously, because it is kelp. Okay. So this is our first ingredient for our kombu rice. So rice was a staple. Other staples for um, the Japanese and samurai would have been potatoes, radishes, cucumbers, beans, uh, persimmons, nuts, apricots. Um, and then obviously seafood like, well, seafood, seaweed, um, seafood like carp, um, abalone, um, which is a type of sea snail that looks kind of like a oyster, um, trout, tuna, um, kind of what we think of Japanese cuisine today. So I've put 
the kombu in the bottom of the pan. And then I'm gonna top it with rice. So you wanna buy short grain white rice. Um, sometimes you'll see it labeled in the grocery store as sushi rice. Um, they're one and the same. They have a lot of starch in them. I've actually washed these, um, soaked them, and strained them. Um, but they still have a lot of starch, and that's what you want. So you're going to put that over your kombu in your pot. Distribute it around. So it covers the kombu. And then you are going to top all of this with enough water to cover the rice. Don't need a lot of water, but enough water to cover the rice. And that's it. You put the um, top on the pot and you put it on heat and let it simmer for about 40 minutes and the rice should be cooked at that point and it should be infused with that kombu broth. Kombu is great because it's also really high in nutrients and minerals so it's, it's a good staple in a samurai diet because they would have a very demanding job and they would need those nutrients um, to, to be samurai. Uh, kombu grows at the bottom of the ocean and it can get up to 12 feet tall and it grows very densely. It's called sea palm as well as kombu. Divers in fact get lost in it because it grows so densely in the ocean so I guess it's also a dangerous plant as well as a healthy plant. Um, hopefully you encounter it as the healthy healthy version of kombu. So kombu was used as a facilitator for cooking. It was found in a lot of different types of dishes not just a rice dish. Other ingredients that would facilitate cooking would have included soy, um, rice vinegar, and salt, of course, for preservation because they would be taking their food with them. So salt would be very important as well. I'm gonna let this go for 40 minutes and when we come back, we will make sake cocktails. Hi, welcome back and we have everything ready for our sake cocktail. But before we get into that, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about samurai. As I said earlier, samurai um, were a warrior class of people. They encompassed 10% of the population. So they weren't a small group. Uh, they were an elite group, obviously, in their skills in battle, um, very, very highly skilled warriors. They were also really highly educated, and most of them were very literate. And again, they could have ranged from upper class to very, very poor. They followed a code called the Bushido, and Bushido means the way of the warrior. It's synonymous with chivalry. So they followed the Bushido code very strictly. They were always ready for battle. They were even ready to take their own lives if they proved dishonorable on the battlefield. Um, the idea um, that we have of ninjas actually came from samurai. They were not an actual separate group. Ninjas actually were samurai, dressed in more stealthy black garb if they needed to do so for, the, for battle. Okay, this isn't a traditional sake cocktail that samurai would have enjoyed. They would have just drank the sake and that's it. So we're gonna um, make it a little fancy so you guys can enjoy it a little more at home, but plain sake by itself is also just as good. So what we have here are our ingredients. We have the shaker. We're going to add some ice to the shaker. Okay. And then we have our sake. We have three parts sake. We have half part lemon juice. Have agave nectar to sweeten it up a little bit. Obviously, some of these things would not be in a normal samurai cocktail. And we have some green Tabasco, a dash of green Tabasco. All right, we're gonna shake this up. Okay, ready to go. So sake um, can be drank warm or hot. They would have probably not warmed it up to drink it, but that's really common in, to, in how we, we serve it today. They actually would have drank it in, um, not a martini glass, of course. They would have drank it in small wooden squared cups, not the fancy way we drink it today, um, but I like it this way. Sake is made from rice, so as you can see, rice was a very important staple in what they drank and what they ate to the Japanese and the samurai. Uh, traditionally, before a samurai battle, they would have had three cups of sake because three is a lucky number in the samurai culture. Um, a traditional meal before battle would have included abalone, which we were talked about earlier. It looks kind of like an oyster, but it's a class of sea snail. Um, kelp or kombu, and again, obviously rice. 
Um, it may have also included some dried nuts just for some extra protein and nutrients on the battlefield. Again, the sake would have been served in a square wooden cup and the meal would have been served on black lacquered plates. Uh, the after, after battle sake ceremony was also popular and they would definitely enjoy some sake. In fact, it was actually impolite not to be inebriated from the sake after battle. So the last thing I'm going to do is I'm going to garnish our sake cocktail with a grapefruit and some mint. I filled that up there. Okay, here you have it, a sake cocktail, a little modernized. We actually call it the Kyoto Sour. Would not have been called that back then. Um, when we come back, we're gonna make a sweet treat to finish off our samurai meal. Hi, welcome back, and we have everything ready for our sweet treat. Samurai would not have traditionally eaten this sweet treat, but I thought it was a good bonus because you always have that leftover rice you never know what to do with after you order Japanese or Chinese takeout. So we are gonna make a sweet treat because we can. All right, you're gonna start with one cup of already cooked rice. If you're using uncooked rice, you can, you can do that as well. Um, don't start with one cup of uncooked rice, start with like one third cup of cooked rice. You put it in a saucepan over some heat. And I failed to mention this is a, my version of a rice pudding, samurai style. So one cup of rice and some milk, whole milk. And you just cook that over a low heat. Let it cook a little bit, let the, the milk absorb into the rice a little bit. You don't want it to be mush, but you want it to be a, a pudding. So we'll let that go for a second. To that, we're going to add two tablespoons of honey. Sweeten it up a little bit. See, it's cooking a little bit now. Just don't, don't burn it, because milk burns. And if you wanted to use uncooked rice, you could. Um, you would just add more milk and cook the rice in the milk, which actually that might taste better. But for the purposes of our dish, I'm showing you how to use the leftover rice that always goes hard and bad in my fridge after I order takeout. Okay, so that was two tablespoons of honey. Now I'm going to add half a teaspoon of vanilla extract. Other Asian spices might be good in this too, like maybe a little star anise or something like that. Okay, you're just gonna let that cook on a low simmer for 10 minutes or so until it thickens a little bit. Uh, to this, you could also add you know, berries, nuts, um, anything that you, that, you, that you like in your rice pudding. Being that I'm known for my southern cooking, this is kind of my version of the samurai southern rice pudding fusion. Um, rice pudding is very popular in the south, so this is a dish that I like to make. It's delicious. And I forgot my most important ingredient, which is our sake. Let's add that now. We'll add a few more minutes to our cooking time. That's okay. Stir that in. And it, it would be good with a sweet sake. There's lots of different versions of sake. There's dry sake, um, sweet sake. Again, you can eat it cold or hot. You would definitely want to have a sweeter sake because again, this is a dessert dish. So that would make the best rice pudding. All right, it looks like we're cooked down just enough. We can remove it from the heat and pop it in our bowl. See how it's thick, but not too thick. It's definitely rice pudding texture. And then I like to top it off with some black sesame seeds. So a little texture to the dish. So here you have it, a sweet treat to end your samurai meal. I'm gonna get this area cleaned up and when you come back, we'll have all three dishes plated. Okay, we're back and we have all three dishes plated. We have our samurai cocktail, our Kyoto sour, it's got sake, lemon juice, agave nectar, and it's garnished with a little mint and grapefruit. We have our kombu rice. And you can see that the kombu has blended in with the rice really nicely. And it's gonna have that taste of the ocean from that kombu. 
Next we have our Chinese yam grated soup. Again, this was made with potato, but if you can find Chinese yam, it'll look a little different and it might taste, taste a little different, but this is as close as we can get it and it's pretty darn good. Then we have our rice pudding made with the sake and the milk and the honey, nice and sweet, and we garnished it with some black sesame seeds. Nothing more Japanese than black sesame seeds. And lastly, we're gonna finish off this samurai celebration just like they would have done after battle with a samurai cocktail. We're calling it the Black Samurai. First, we're gonna take our glass and we're gonna dip it in a little sesame oil and add some sesame seeds to the rim. So this is also a pretty cocktail. Samurai would have been proud of this. We're gonna add some ice. All right. Okay, I'm gonna top it off with obviously our sake. And we're gonna add a little soy sauce. And lastly, some mirin, which is just sweetened sake to sweeten it up. And there you have it, folks, your black samurai cocktail, strong enough for any samurai. We have our kombu rice, our pudding, and our Chinese yam soup, and our sake cocktail. Two sake cocktails, one big feast fit for a samurai. Thank you for joining me on this chapter of the story of cooking. I'm Sarah Nicholas. I'll see you next time. Thank you.